This is Behind the Mic with Brad Dalius. Behind the Mic is live on this Thursday evening, May the 3rd, 2018. Kings Cove, here inside the Toyota Sports Center in El Segundo, just off of Nash Street. Brad Dalius and Keith Jackson hanging out on this NBA Finals evening where we've got Game 2 action that just finished about an hour ago or so up north the border. Once again, the Cleveland Cavaliers, LeBron James and company, they win it in Game 2. They take a two-games-to-none series lead over the Toronto Raptors. We'll dissect it here in just a bit. You've got Philly and Boston currently battling it out in Massachusetts and Boston there, Game 2. Sixers got up big in this game, but credit the Celtics. They've made a run here close to the half. They cut it to five at halftime. They're now running in the third quarter. Close one here. We'll keep tabs on it as well. We have to get into, later on this evening, big contract extension today for Matt Ryan, the Atlanta Falcons. He is going to be a $30 million man per year. We'll talk about it later this evening. We have also have this evening a great guest comes your way around 8 o'clock. We're going to chat with Chris Childs, former NBA player, used to play for the Knicks, the Nets as well in the early 2000s. We'll get his thoughts on the NBA playoffs and more. And also tonight we'll talk about the Kentucky Derby as the Run for the Roses comes up this weekend from Churchill Downs. We'll talk about that around 7.30. We'll check in with Alicia Hughes, the racing editor from Blood House Magazine, Blood Horse Magazine, that is. We'll talk with her around 7.30 tonight. But first, we have to start tonight as we're bringing Keith Jackson now with this Game 2 that just finished about an hour ago. LeBron and company getting it done tonight, Keith. Once again, I know you're not surprised. I'm definitely not surprised. It's kind of like, you know, you, you, you look at this and it's just like, wow, it's unbelievable how the Raptors are playing right now. You know, it's just like... You know, they, this is like a huge bump in the road for them, and they can't seem to get out of it. And, you know, it's a, what a shame that this team is now in a number one seeded team, and here they are, and they'll 2 against the uh, Cleveland Cavaliers that are really don't have the same amount, uh, just amount of more talent as them. I mean, this is also a Dwayne Casey. He should be, honestly, he's got to be on the hot seat. If you can't get past the, uh, the Cleveland Cavaliers and it's been at least four times, something has to change. This team has to go away. They have to change this team. Oh, I completely agree. I think you even have to go beyond Dwayne Casey at this point, Keith, and just look at the team as a whole. Kyle Lowry, good player in the playoffs, he shrinks. He's a good player, not a great player. I think the same can be said about DeMar DeRozan as well, although he's played better than Lowry at times this postseason. He has a long way to go until he gets into even the conversation of like a Donovan Mitchell. I mean, Donovan Mitchell at this point is playing at a much higher clip in his rookie year than DeMar DeRozan is. And I mean, DeMar DeRozan can be considered a veteran compared to Donovan Mitchell. So they're underperforming. And as a Raptors fan, obviously it has to be extremely disappointing. I, I almost think back to... When I'm trying to compare a one seed that had high expectations as Toronto did in this playoff series and as playoffs as a whole, as far as being such a disappointment in these first two games of this conference semis, I got to think back to almost the Golden State Warriors and the Dallas Mavericks from 2007 where you had... Yeah, right. You had Golden State knock off the Mavericks. It was kind of almost the start, if you will, of the Golden State era of success over the last decade or so. Uh, that's what I go back to as far as just being shock and awe, just stunned uh, from Toronto's perspective. Yeah. I almost go back to something like that. In football, if you go outside of basketball, I look to maybe the Green Bay Packers from a couple of years ago when they won 15 games in the regular season and got yeah. stunned in the playoffs by a red-hot New York uh, Giants football team. 
that to me, those are the type of comparisons that I draw at this point with Toronto, where they're at, and losing the first couple games of this series when, as we've talked about for so long during this regular season and even up to where they're at now in the conference semis, golden opportunity for them to get to the NBA Finals. And, boy, there was a lot of pressure on them tonight, and they wilted big time. This is their best opportunity, to be honest with you, like you said. I mean, when you look at it, man, it's like, come on, you're a number one seed. LeBron James does not have a veteran group with him this year. It's really just him. I mean, the, Kevin Love's not playing great ball right now. He's really on the down. Kristen Thompson is playing okay. J.R. Smith is still inconsistent, J.R. Smith. And then you got guys all coming off the bench that have never been in this position before. And they're out playing two all-stars, one defensive player of the year, Serge Ibaka, and let's and let's not, and then they got a core of other players on that squad that's been there before. It's just a shame to see what they're doing in, in this time. I mean, for Toronto fans out there, they have to be very upset. I mean, just, I'm not even a fan, but it's just like I'm not even a fan of Toronto. But it, it's like, man, you want to see good basketball, want to see some people competing, and it, it's like they just can't get over that hurdle. And it's. They can't, and if you can't get over that hurdle, then you got to make a change. They have to be bold enough to make changes, and it has to it has to come this summer. I mean, you got to think about moving either Kyle Lowry or Demar Derozan. One of those guys got to be moved. Demar Derozan, okay, he just signed a new contract, so we have hard for that. But I'm thinking of even a trade up. You probably got to trade up Kyle Lowry. Sergio Baca's probably got to go. Uh, and then on top of that, you got to get some blood in there, new coaching staff, or, because there's no way that you can be a number one team throughout the whole season, beat them in the preseason, in the, in the regular season, and then when you get to the playoffs and you're at home and you lose 0-2, you have the advantage. There is no way that should happen. One man, LeBron J, should not be able to beat all of them. And really, it's really what I look at it, it's straight intimidation. It's an intimidation factor, and that's exactly what it is. They're intimidated and they're scared, Cleveland Cavaliers, and, that's when they're, and they're playing like it. LeBron was red hot tonight, Keith. I mean, 19 of 28 shooting from the floor, 43 points he pours in. Just unbelievable. Spread the wealth around, 14 assists. That's what he does, and it just, like you said, he should not be able to do it single handedly himself against this entire Toronto Raptors team. But that's exactly what happened. You mentioned some of the guys that Toronto has, what maybe they could do this summer, what they can't do. I agree. Maybe they have to look to move a Kyle Lowry or DeMar DeRozan. But the thing is, who's really going to be attracted to go there to Toronto? Like you mentioned before, this was their window. It's closing fast, especially with Philly and Boston being so young. And they're only going to yeah. continue to get better going into next season, especially if LeBron leaves and goes to either Houston or out here in L.A. in the Western Conference next year. Uh, that's only going to open it up more so for teams like the Celtics and Sixers, who, by the way, right now, Boston has just taken a lead over Philly, 64-63. We'll keep you posted on it. But, again, you can't say enough about how Toronto right now is just wilting, wilting at the feet of LeBron. It's, I mean, really, it's, yeah. it's just brutal. And it was so predictable. That's the thing. You didn't have to even watch this game. This was so, so predictable. Toronto did the exact same thing they did in game one. They got up 10, 15 points. Very typical. Cleveland felt them out. Then ultimately, LeBron and company went on their run like they do, and they followed the script perfectly. I mean, really, I mean, this was out of Hollywood. If you could have pulled the script out of Paramount Pictures in Burbank, honestly, I mean, it was just crazy how this thing went according to plan here in Toronto in game two. But what shot do they have now to come back in this series? Do they have any shot? Is it 0%? No. Is it done? No, they may get swept. They may, they're going to get swept. They're, that's what it's going to be. It's, this, this, this series is over. They're going to get swept. Cleveland's going to win it at home. They're going to have a lot of time to rest. And you know what's great? This is great for LeBron James because, you know, he needs the rest. He needs the rest in order to get this team, to get his rest, to make a run for the uh, finals championship. And you see what you're going to see in, in Philadelphia and Boston. That's going to be a battle. And that looks like that may go to the uh, – may go at least six games. So I'm looking at – I'm looking at Cleveland sweeping uh, right now. Cleveland's going to sweep uh, Toronto. It looks that way. I'm with you. I don't know if they'll get a game either. 
I really don't. After when you lose two on your home court like this and just choking, there's no other way around it. They totally choked in game one, and tonight the wheels just fell off in this 128 to 110 defeat. But I'm with you. I, I don't think it's going to happen. I think they'll get swept. Uh, considering they're one and 28 in their last 29 games or so in Cleveland, when the Raptors have gone on the yeah. road down there, no shot, no shot at all. At no shot. Point. Just getting started tonight uh-huh. here on Behind the Mic. We're live from Kings Cove inside the Toyota Sports Center over here in El Segundo, just off of Nash Street. Come on down. If you can't make it out, you can listen online live at BehindTheMicShow.com. We're also available on the Behind the Mic app. You can check out our podcast on iHeartRadio. We're going to step aside for a break. We'll come back, and on the other side, we'll get into some Kentucky Derby discussion as well. We'll play a little nay or nay here on Behind the Mic. You'll find out what I'm talking about in just a little bit. At the bottom of the hour, we'll speak with Alicia Hughes. She'll call in. She is the racing editor from Blood Horse Magazine, bloodhorse.com. We'll chat with her and get her thoughts about the run for the roses this weekend, the fastest two minutes in sports, if you will, from Churchill Downs in Kentucky. And also later on tonight, we're going to speak with Chris Childs, former NBA player, former New York Nick. We'll get his thoughts on the hire today of David Fisdale as the New York Knicks go into a new era of basketball in the Big Apple. That and more coming up tonight here, live on Behind the Mic from Kings Cove. Every 17 minutes, make a wish makes the impossible possible. They tame dragon. They bring Saturn to Earth. <laughs> they help superheroes save entire city. Yeah, yeah. They even make unicorns fly. All to give children the strength they need to fight their critical illnesses. Every wish takes muscle. Help us make sure every wish comes true. Join us at wish.org. Dave, what are you doing? Just sending a gift to Dave2037. Who? Me in the future. I save a little money from every paycheck as a gift to Dave2037. So he can spend it on things like anti-gravity boots or a hologram Doberman. Something cool like that. I think Dave2037 deserves it. He worked hard. What are you getting Steve2037? I guess I was thinking Steve2037 would just fend for himself. Well, all right. But don't expect to be borrowing my anti-gravity boots. You want to have money in your future? You got to start saving now. Putting some money from every paycheck into a savings account or contributing to your 401k can make a big difference later. Put away a few bucks, feel like a million bucks. For free ideas and easy ways to save, go to feedthepig.org. That's feedthepig.org. Hey, let's just hope Steve2037 doesn't get his hands on a cool time machine because he is going to come back here and knock some sense into you. This message brought to you by the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants and the Ad Council. Oh man, here he is. We all come to here he is. <laughs> what did we order tonight? Hey, that worked out well. That worked out really well. I can believe it. No matter where they live in this country, we'll be there. We stand strong. United. Stand with us in caring for our veterans. Everybody buckle up. Bum, 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 bum. Buckle up. Let's go. Buckle up. Can we go to the store? Mom, buckle can we get up. Some ice cream? Everybody. Everybody buckle up. A lot goes on in the car, but you're in control. So only move when you hear the click that says they're buckled in. Never give up until they buckle up. Learn more at safercar.gov slash kidsbuckleup. A message from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. Hi, I'm Danica Patrick and proud aunt. Watching my nieces grow, play, and learn is amazing. But not every child gets to be carefree. One in six kids in the U.S. are hungry. One in six. That little girl sitting alone at the playground, she can't play like the other kids. She doesn't have the energy because she's hungry. School lunch will be her only meal today. It breaks my heart that this is the reality in our country, but it's something that Feeding America is working to change. Each year, the Feeding America network of food banks rescues billions of pounds of good food that would have gone to waste. This food is then provided to families and children in need. Being a kid should be about using your imagination, learning, and having fun. These children shouldn't have to miss out on simply being a kid because they're hungry. To find out how you can help end childhood hunger in your community, visit feedingamerica.org. 
Brought to you by Feeding America and the Ad Council. Everybody buckle up. Bum, 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 bum. Buckle up. Let's go. Buckle up. Can we go to the store? Come on, buckle can we up. Get some ice cream? Come on, come on, come on, come on, everybody. Everybody, buckle up. A light goes on in the car, but you're in control. So only move when you hear the click that says they're buckled in. Never give up until they buckle up. Learn more at safercar.gov slash kidsbuckleup. A message from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. Our military service members volunteer to protect us in the most dangerous places around the world. They step up. And when they are severely ill or injured, returning to their families is only the beginning of their long road home. Beyond all the hospitals and doctors and surgeries they need just to survive, they also deserve whatever they need to truly live. All the in-home care and day-to-day -day help they need to live independently, on their own terms. Wounded Warrior Project long-term support programs were established to provide these brave men and women whatever they need to continue their fight for independence at no cost for life. So many of them need us, and it's time for a grateful nation to step up. Find out how you can do your part at findwwp.org. I'm more resourceful than I thought. My suit can still make an impression. My video games are still game changers. And my lamp can bring others a bright future. Because when I donate my stuff to Goodwill, it helps fund job placement and training for people right in my community. Now my stuff gets a second chance. And will give someone in my community a second chance too. Goodwill. Donate stuff. Create jobs. Find your nearest donation center at Goodwill.org. That's Goodwill.org. This message brought to you by Goodwill and the Ad Council. This is Behind the Mic with Brad Dalius. Celtics now up 76-68 as they run 224 to go in the third quarter. There goes the Celtics once again, Keith. Man, that, that team basketball. Of course, the return tonight of Jalen Brown, making things that much more difficult for Philly. Once again, a test that when you play the Celtics, it truly is a marathon, not a sprint. It absolutely is. It's, you know, Brad Stevenson, um, he has that team playing. It's a system, really literally a system when you play that team. It has nothing to do with star athletes. And this is crazy. When you watch this team, you see an emergent of a Terry Rozier playing. Um, Al Horford, I mean, I used to doubt Al Horford a lot. Now I'm like, wow, like the way he's playing in this system. Brad Stevenson is, a, is one of those coaches that you know how some coaches come from. Co there are, some college coaches are afraid to step out to the pros. And then some pro college, uh, pro coaches – are afraid to step into college. And, and Brad Stevenson, as one of those guys who's been successful at both college and and pro, and it's great to see how he's got those guys playing. And it, it, it's it's really remarkable to watch. And, you know, without a Kyrie Irving, without a, um, without a Gordon Hayward, could you imagine? This team, that team would be in the – that team still could possibly go to the championship without Kyrie Irving. And without Brad, without Gordon Hayward. It is amazing. It is amazing. But you're right. It's all about the system that comes in. System and team play always beats individual stars. Totally agree. Seven days a week, ten times out of ten, you can bank on it. We'll get back to the basketball in just a bit. As I said, we have some Kentucky Derby discussion on deck tonight. We're going to be speaking with Alicia Hughes coming up in about ten minutes or so at the bottom of the hour. We'll get her thoughts on some of the favorites to look forward to this weekend at Churchill Downs for the run for the roses. We're going to play a little game here now called Nay or Nay. Or in other words... Another nay word. or Nay. Nay or Nay. That's, that's the day. <laughs> the horse is still waking up. <laughs> but basically, I'm going to name Keith different names of horses... 
that are going to be taking part in the Kentucky Derby this week that may or may not be taking part. And you have to tell me whether or not it's actually a real name of a horse that's going to be in the Derby field this week. All right, let's do it. What do you say? All right. First one, combatant. Combatant. Is that a Kentucky Derby horse or no? Nay. Yes, it's actually a real horse. Really? Real horse. Combatant, wow. yes. Combat- combatant will be in the field this week. This is going to be fun, actually. <laughs> it's not as easy as you would think. It's not. Next one. Decoy. Decoy. Nay. That's correct. All that is right. correct. It, I went on a limb there. Yes, that is correct. Uh, decoy is not a real horse. You will not see Decoy this weekend at the Kentucky Derby. Next one, Audible. Come on, Audible, like, what kind of name is Audible? Nay. Oh, my God. It's a real horse. That's a real horse? (laughs) It's a real horse, Audible. What are these names? What do people do to come up with these names? What happened to, like, Hank, Rocky? What happened to names like that? People get a little more creative now these days. It is 2018, you know. Jesus. And they got they got to go through the book here and pull out the best ones. Justify. Justify. I'm gonna say, nah. That's a real horse tail. Really? Yeah, that's a real horse. Wait, Justify wait. is actually you said the nah was or is nay. No, no, no. So like a, a horse goes like nay, like when they 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 cry out, they go nay, like nay. You know yeah. what I mean? Uh, or like nay, like n a y. Okay. As a no. Okay. That's the name of the game, nay or nay. Nay or nay. Nay or nay. Okay. I was going with, I, I, what I was going to say is nay. Nay or nay, right? That's hard. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. How about with this? How about we just go with yes or no? All right. I was going to go with yes, that was a real horse. That's a real horse. Oh, then you were right then. Yeah, yeah. You are right then. My bad. We'll go, to keep it simple here, we'll go with yes or no. How about that? Come on, that? people. You know, how, you know out there. You know that was very hard. That's like a tongue twister. Brad's trying to throw a tongue twister at me. Of course. I'm trying to make this uh, you know, a little uh, little tricky here. We'll mix things up. <laughs> Adversary. Oh, okay. I'm going to say yeah. That is correct. Yes. Adversary is a, is, a, uh, is a real horse. Yeah. Next one. Validate. 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 Like, validate the stamp. See, I would... Okay, I would have a horse. I would name him Validate. Like, yeah, he validate. That's a validated horse. Like, he va- it's valid. But uh, I'm going to say, no, that's not a real name. That is correct. You're right. Yeah. yeah no, I, well, it's funny because I'm with you. This is one... I made this one up. I, I thought this would actually be a good horse. Yeah. That'd be a good race horse. Heck name, yeah. Right? yeah. Yeah, Good Magic. Good Magic is a horse, yes. That is correct. Yes, good magic. Great name. Great, great name. Last one here as we wrap up this quick game of nay or nay. Nay or nay. Instilled regard. Instilled regard. Okay, I've seen in Kentucky Derby, I've seen long names before. Like, it, 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 Some of them are like sentences and things like that. So I'm thinking that that is really a horse. Yes, that is correct. Good job. Overall, Woo! not bad. Not bad, Keith. I'm not bad. That's right. Not Kentucky too bad. Derby. I, I, but let me tell you, I'm not betting this year. I bet. Let me tell you something. I oh, yeah? On the Kentucky you bet Derby. before? I've been on the Kentucky Derby one time. Have you ever gone? Yes. Oh, you have oh, no, gone? No, I haven't gone. To, no, I've been to a horse race, but not the Kentucky Derby. Not the Derby. I okay. do want to do it. That's on my bucket list, though. Same here. To go to the Kentucky Derby. But I remember betting. I went out. It was really fun. I bet on some horse, some horses, and I bet on the Kentucky Derby, and I lost by a hair. Like a length of a nose, I was like, I'll never do it again. I was so upset. I lost. L- like that, that, that. I mean, literally, at photo finish. It's crazy. And lost. I've never done horse racing betting. Uh, when I was, it's fun. Yeah, I've. So I was. Remember, talked about my uh, Bahamas trip over the uh, winter, beginning of January. I was down there, and um, we did some did some betting. Did a little betting uh, with with the friends and, and the family. Uh, sports. Uh-huh. Um, the that was like the wild card weekend. I want to say. I was, did some betting on Chiefs, Titans. Uh, you know, they got you can place bets on everything now. The stats, over, under, you name it. Uh, and uh, that was kind of fun. <laughs> it didn't do so hot, yeah. but it was kind of fun to try it. I was like, okay, that, that was good. I wouldn't necessarily uh, do it again uh, until at least I have a little more uh, better knowledge, let's say, uh, of uh, knowing when to, when to lay down the cash in, in certain spots. But uh, that was my, that was my uh, trial run. 
yeah. of it, if you will. But never yeah. horse racing. I haven't really ventured into that one yet. But I'm with you, though. Kentucky Derby, definitely a bucket list type of item. You got to go. And you know what's so great about the Kentucky Derby? It's not just everything building up to it. The hats that the people wear, the the even just the wardrobe that people wear. I mean, they really go out, man. They spend a lot of money on that. I mean, the horses alone, I mean, they, they breed those guys. And, you know, I do all kind of stuff to them. I'm, you know, I'm sad about that. But on the flip side, like, it's just what an event. It's, it's historic. And everyone, if you go, if you don't like horses or you're not interested in the Kentucky Derby, I'll tell you this. If you ever go to a horse race, it would change your mind. I think so. That's what I hear. That's what I hear. And obviously we have like the Santa Anita Derby. That's probably the closest one out here in Southern California. That's one I can get to as well. Got a lot. You know me. I, I, I got a lot of my sports bucket lists. A lot of places I've been fortunate to cross off, uh, but Stu, uh, it's there, there's so much sport. The sports world has so much to offer. So many great venues. Seventy nine, seventy five, Boston with the four point edge as they come up to the end of the third quarter, heading to the fourth Uh-oh. in Beam Town. Close one. Philly may be in trouble. Great finish coming up. Uh, yeah, I mean, in danger of going down. O two, obviously, can't have it. But I. But but my, on the flip side. Philly will, will, will go home and take care of business at home. They're more likely to do that, right, than, than other teams. Toronto who, Raptors. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say that. That's a good comparison. You're right. Philly is more – not to mention that Philly and Boston are much more closer yeah. on an even playing field than Toronto and Cleveland is, where obviously you have such a psychological aspect to that series at this point where they're just totally in their heads. And I mentioned to you a little earlier at the top of the show, what, are, what it's – Toronto's like 1-29 – in their last 30 road games at Cleveland, something crazy astronomical like that, yeah. that just obviously plays into the conversation of just having no shot at all. No shot at all of getting back into the series. We do have Stanley Cup playoffs in action tonight. Nashville just scored on Winnipeg. They're up one nothing. end of the first up there in Canada. Pittsburgh, they defeat the Caps tonight 3-1 to in Western PA. That series now is tied at 2-2. Obviously, a lot of talk about the Capitals. Their kryptonite has been the Penguins haven't been able to get past Pittsburgh and get to the Eastern Conference Finals. So that series, though, is uh, it's getting competitive. It's getting good, uh, yeah. which Washington has not been able to do. They haven't been able to hold up their side of the bargain in quite a long time. So definitely interesting series to follow. We know what happened out west last night. It was not the Golden Knights evening as they lost 4 nothing. I said, oh, you know. This team, no problem. No problem. They'll force overtime, maybe even double yep. overtime. Who knows? Maybe they'll come back and win four to three. It was not in the cards last night, clearly. What is going on? Not, yeah, not at all. This is a good San Jose team. I know. Evidently. I, and and uh, they've really been able to stick it to them. Good crowd there, too. I mean, we talked about the crowd in Vegas and what we've seen uh, watching some of the games on TV, especially here at Kings Cove in recent weeks. Yeah. But the Sharks, they have their own home ice advantage going on too some of the uh, 49ers players were there jimmy garoppolo some of the other guys were supporting the team kind of similar to what you saw with uh, marcus mariota and some of the tennessee titans cheering on the nashville predators uh-huh. in the music city so a lot of different uh, arenas now getting uh, somewhat of a a good home ice advantage so that series continues to roll on that one is tied at two as well Stanley Cup playoffs are not disappointing so far. Uh, again, it, night and day compared to the regular season. Night and day. You really you really can't compare it at all. So that's what's going on across the sports world. You also have the Dodgers. Uh, they are uh, they're actually off tonight. The, and, uh, the, the Angels. Are the doing Angels. Uh, 4-0. They're up 4 nothing right over Baltimore. That's correct as well. So, Wait. Can I just mention something right now? Atlanta versus the New York Mets, 11-0. I mean, Wow. That's crazy. You know what else is crazy, though? Let me tell you something. This New York Yankee team is going to be tough. They beat the Astros tonight, 6-5. to five. That's going to be a tough uh, – that's going to be a battle. You know, that – that play. I can't wait to play out for baseball already. I'm like, the Yankees are playing out – they're playing out their mind. I know. We're already here. It's just May 3rd, and we're already excited for uh, Major League Baseball, the playoffs. I, I got to say, even though the Dodgers have not played their best, obviously, here – so far, they certainly have played well enough to, to keep your interest, obviously, and yeah. the same can be said for the Angels as well. So that's what's going on in Major League Baseball. We're going to switch gears now here, 
and talk a little Kentucky Derby. Obviously, we've been, we've been prepping this so far this exactly. evening. Big run coming up on Saturday, obviously, from Churchill Downs. And now joining us on the line to talk about this weekend's race, Alicia Hughes. She covers uh, horse racing for Blood Horse Magazine. You can also check them out at bloodhorse.com. Alicia, thanks so much for joining us tonight here on Behind the Mic. How are you? I am good. How's it going, Brad? I'm doing great, thanks. Uh, it, it's a great night, obviously, and so much is going on right now in the world of sports, obviously. And it, it's a great time when we get into May because we have the playoffs in hockey. We also have the playoffs in the NBA. Baseball has started to heat up in month number two. And here comes a little race that always takes place the first Saturday of May in Churchill Downs, the Kentucky Derby, the 100th and 44th running this year. I'm excited for it. I know a lot of horse racing fans are as well. Right off the bat for you, Alicia, what's the biggest storyline, in your opinion, as we head into this Saturday's Derby? I think the biggest for- the biggest storyline, and it's funny you just you asked me that because I was actually just discussing that with a coworker not 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 that long ago, is the fact of just the overwhelming depth and quality of this year's Derby field. I mean, it kind of goes without saying, obviously the. The whole purpose of the Derby is to try to gather the 20 best three-year-olds, uh, you know, of their class in this point of time. But this year's Derby field, that we've had, we've certainly had some good ones in recent years. The the, the the quality in it is, you know, I think you can easily go about eight to nine horses deep of horses where if they were to jump up and win, it wouldn't in, in the least bit uh, be uh, a, a surprise at all. Of course, at the top you've got a, a horse with a with Justify undefeated grade one winner from the Bard of Bob Baffer, who obviously trained American Pharaoh to win um, a few years ago, and he's just a magnificent specimen of a horse out there. You know, he's very lightly raced. He only has three career starts. He only started racing this year. He did not race at two, so he's got the, I'm sure you all have heard the Curse of Apollo mention more times than than one so far, but uh, I said he he's kind of the, the, the favorite, but uh, I think it says something to the fact that you've got Todd Fletcher, who won this race last year with Always Dreaming, is back with four contenders this, this year, one of whom is also an undefeated grade one winner, three others who all won major prep races their last time out, and he probably isn't going to have a horse within the first two or three betting choices. That says something as to how good the, the field is right there. Wow. And l- let me ask you, um, Alicia, what about, I'm, I'm looking at some of the horses here and some of the odds. I mean, who's, who, who is going to be the horse that's really going to um, shock everyone? If, I mean, if, 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 if you look at the, you know, look at the, the actual lineup, who is a horse that someone you, that you have to keep your eye on in this race? I I think if there's a horse who's going to be, like I said, and this is going to be a race where you're going to get some very good odds on some very good horses just going down the morning line. The fact that Good Magic, who's a reigning two-year-old champion, who's coming off a win last time out in the Bluegrass Stakes, is is is, is twelve to one. I'll tell you right now, if Good Magic is anywhere close to twelve to one on Derby. Day, I'll be going to, to the windows hard on on that one. That's a fantastic price on him. But I think a horse who's probably going to be in some double-digit odds would be one who people would maybe want to look towards using, especially if the track comes up wet, is uh, is a flame away. This is a horse uh, trained by Mark Cassie. Extremely, extremely consistent horse. He's got he's got five wins over three over three different surfaces. He's won on turf. He's won on dirt. He's won on synthetic. He's won over a, a, a wet track before. Like I said, and he may not be good enough quite to, to win it, but this horse is tough as nails, and he's always there. And, and the Bluegrass Stakes, I was really impressed with him. He kind of took all the heat up on, on, the, on the front end, and he still had to make good magic kind of work to get by him in, in, in that stretch. So I said. Flame of Ways won. I don't know that he's that he's good enough to win it, but I think whoever wins it is going to have to go through him in order to do it. I would definitely use him uh, in some of your plays on Saturday. Alicia Hughes joining us from Blood Horse Magazine, bloodhorse.com. What's something I don't know about the Kentucky Derby, Alicia, if I've never been to Churchill Downs on Derby Day? What's something you don't know about the Derby? Yes, uh, if I've never been to all, Churchill the, Downs. The, the, first of all, as we're going to find out again this the, this weekend, there's this notion that the fact that it rains is kind of a rare thing. Yeah, no, that's, that that has happened quite frequently in recent years, and it's probably going to happen again this week. And so this notion that, that, that an off-track is, 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 is a rare thing, yeah, that's not necessarily true. Um, another thing I think that just, in, yeah, so this is, this is a little bit on, on the cheesy side, but something that you don't, that you just can't quite grasp unless you're there is just kind of 
the atmosphere of the of, of the of the of the whole scene, especially that moment, you know, when they come out of the out of the tunnel, they're in the post parade. You get the my old Kentucky home, so you got 160,000 plus people all at the same time. If you've never been there, it's a really it's one of those things you kind of have to be there to, to kind of really feel it. And even if you've been there a hundred times, it's just one of those kind of chill moments that sort of kind of, you know, get to you. And I mean, even after all these years, when they get to that post parade and, and like they're through that, 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 that moment, my, I still get the, the, the stomach flip a little bit. You've gotten a chance to be around a bunch of these horses the last couple of days. Was there something that maybe stood out to you from one of the horses you've seen, whether it be Justify, who's currently the favorite, or maybe another horse in this running on Saturday that kind of made you stop and think, you know, maybe we should keep an eye on this horse come Saturday? Um, personally, I think Good Magic has been training just out of his skin since he won the, the, the Bluegrass Stakes at, at, at Keeneland. This horse, I mean, I said... He's getting over the ground fantastic. He physically looks bigger and stronger. And I've said this to more than one person. If the mood of a barn means anything about how a horse is doing, this horse is sitting on on, what, on a, the race of his life because his trainer, Chad Brown, I've never seen Chad this loose and this happy and, the, and this confident before a, a big race. And Chad Brown has led a lot of really good horses over for some of the best races in this country. And that barn is just... They're just openly happy and confident and loose right now. Like, they know they've got a horse sitting on something big. And I said, he just, like I said, he can't, he, he couldn't look any better, in my opinion, with the way he, he's trading right now. And you know, I said, just knowing how that barn is and knowing and seeing how they're behaving right now, I'm taking that as a tell that, you know, they know they've got something. Follow Alicia on Twitter at BH underscore A Hughes. Okay, who you got on Saturday, Alicia? Who do you like to win? I'm I'm, I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna go with Good Magic for the reasons I just said. I just like I said I've had the pleasure of being able to, you know, I've basically had him in, in in my backyard for almost a month when he was at the when he was at Keeneland. I watched his bluegrass. I watched him train there, and he just he he just looks like he's sitting on something, and he has. You know, he looks like he's coming up to a very similar form cycle as he did last year when he came and won the the Breeders' Cup Juvenile in what was his third career start. This is going to be his third start back for this year. And his, his, his connections have made it very clear all along that their goal was not the peak in February, wasn't the peak in March. Their goal was to, was the peak on, on May 5th. And he, he, just, he just looks like he's coming up to it, you know, as good as he can, you know, you know, with Justify, you know, he, he may be a freak. You know, we don't know that yet. I mean, he, like I said, he's basically, you know, cantered his way through these first th- three wins. But, you know, three, he only has three starts. You never know what's going to happen and with, with how these horses are going to react when they get into this into a 20-horse field. Like I said, he may be a freak. He may be that, that, that good. But I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with good magic. And let me ask you this, Alicia, just really fast. What is the key... In the Kentucky Derby, these guys they're racing, and you said you're going with good magic. And what's what, the key what, for the Derby? Well, what is the yeah? But no, I mean, what is the key to, to for an upset in terms of how do they these these other horses like Audibles are heard as a fan favorite? But what is the key for upsetting some of these more stellar horses? Is it is it going just kind of riding their hip on the way into the until you get to the down stretch to the last fifty years? 50 or so yards or what is the key to even I think I mean I think just I mean so much of it this in like I said and we can in you know, the traders will sell this but we could all sit here and discuss how we think it's going to play out on, on paper and then the gates open a hole or things happen I think the pace scenario as always has a lot to do with it um, and the, 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 the pace ever since they've gone to, to the new qualifying point system whereas before it used to be a, a graded earnings ever since they've gone to the qualifying point system if you notice the, the, the horse who's gone up as a bait, as the betting favorite has actually won every single year and the theory behind that is because with this new system, it basically has has you know prevented horses, you know more sprinter type horses who would have qualified in years past from kind of getting in there and quite frankly kind of inflating the the, the pace a bit and setting it up for maybe some some outside horses. So how the pace sets up is going to be key. There's a lot of horses in this year who who have the ability to be forwardly placed and on the lead. You know you know you have Flame Away who's going to be up there. Promises fulfilled. His trainer did. 
Detail, Detail Robles has made it very clear he's going come hell or, or, or high water, he's going to be in front. And also just you have the unknowns. We saw what happened last year with Classic Empire and a That's few right. others. The gates bring open, he gets slammed and wiped out like right at the start. So we can sit here and discuss scenarios. Yeah. If the gates open and all of a sudden Good Magic and Justify, who are right you know, near each other, if they slam into each other, all of a sudden, you know, there's two of your top horses who might, you know, have themselves taken out by by, uh, by, by circumstance. So, I said, we could sit here and dissect pace and speed figures and this and that or the other. And, like I said, but you, you, there's no way to really factor in all those little, you know, it's hard to guess all those little intangibles that might come in. Who's going to be hung wide? Who's going to get trapped down? Who might be making a move and have a, you know, a tiring horse back up into them and kind of kill their, their, their momentum around there. So, um... I said it's. I get that. That's why it's a derby. That's why it's so tough to win, and that's why you know. In you know, they say you know the, the best horse doesn't always win the derby. You've got to have ability, but you've got to have as much luck uh, on that day as much of anything. Alicia Hughes, she has the pulse for Blood Horse Magazine. Thanks so much tonight, Alicia. We really appreciate the time. Enjoy the rest of the week. Thank you so much. I appreciate you guys having me on. Thank you. There she goes. Once again, Alicia Hughes, racing editor from Blood Horse Magazine and bloodhorse.com. Follow her on Twitter at BH underscore A Hughes. So there you go. Yeah. A lot of good insights there from Churchill Downs. She had me going for a minute for, for a good, I was like, good magic Fleming way. I'm like, oh, it's going to be one of them. And I was like, I'm going with Fleming way. Just the way she was <laughs> explaining it and she was breaking it down into details. I was like, Fleming way is the, the, probably the one that's going to win it. But. On the flip side, I, 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 she's totally right. It's also based on um, the weather. The weather really changes a lot. Well, that was interesting because I do know, and like people who generally watch the Kentucky Derby each year, it does rain maybe, not every year, but maybe once every other, once every three years. You know what and I mean? Every like one I've, Everyone I've seen on TV for some reason is raining. I'm like, <laughs> well, it's funny, like... I, when did you actually like start watching horse racing, like the Triple Crown events? Like, when did you get into that? I guess when I got older, I could start betting. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> but no, I like, mean, well, like, uh, for, like for me, it was Smarty Jones in '04. Yeah. That that really got me into watching it for the first. Like, I never really watched any of the Let Triple t- Crown races you know before. Really, then. you know what? Charlie really, really interested me to start doing watching horse races. The movie Sea Biscuit. That was a good movie. And I think that yeah. came out in like 2004, yeah. somewhere around there. And then after that, I was like really interested in stuff. The only thing I don't like about I just hope no horses get hurt, knock on wood, because I hate that. That's like the worst thing to me. It's like You're like my sister. It's just an animal lover, and you, you hate I to hate see that. that. I hate that, really. So hopefully everyone comes out healthy and ends the race healthy. That's what I'm hoping for. Not Like you said, knock on wood there. Uh, we obviously hope for the best. Do you remember, this is going back now, maybe like five, ten years ago, there was a horse like 50 to 1 odds to win the Derby. And there was a better who they actually profiled this guy on NBC during the telecast. He put down a crazy bet. And since it was a 50 to 1 odds, he wound up winning like 500 grand. Really? Yeah, it was crazy. I forget the exact amount. This is going back a couple years. But it was an awesome thing to watch. I mean, one in a billion type of chance. Like you would never, you'll never see that type of thing again. The way they profiled it, uh, that was crazy. Talking about betting and how things can get wild yeah. with the sport itself, and obviously, it, it's really picked up momentum in the last couple of years when we had the Triple Crown winner in American Pharaoh back in 2015. That's really got a lot more of the public yeah. into it. If they weren't already into horse racing, it really helped to, to bring it back to to somewhat of a it's never going to be like it was in the 30s and 40s obviously in the 50s uh but for 2018 and modern day i think the sport is still doing okay and and that's a lot of that is thanks to what happened just three years ago with american pharaoh obviously but it's exciting i always look forward to the first saturday in may it happens to also coincide with cinco de mayo keith so not bad you kind of get a two for one there it does cinco de mayo is a triple g fight coming up on cinco de mayo too bad it's not Canelo, but he's fighting, and that's going to be great to see. So, you know, and you know, and then a, a good it's going to be a good event coming up with the Kentucky Derby, and you know, it's definitely something to watch, man. I, I love watching the Kentucky Derby, and you know, like I said, 
it's like she said. It's not the. It's not just the actual race, but the everything building up to the race, the atmosphere, what the people wear. It's it's like wow. Everybody's putting their out together. It's like a big party. It's a it's a big party, and it's insane. I talked to um, a friend of mine. She lives and uh, she actually works at at uh, TMZ. She's probably everybody probably knows. She's her name is Kelly, and she's on the. She's the main girl on the show. She sits in the morning meeting, and she lives in Kentucky. She's from Kentucky, and she's told me like, man, when the Kentucky Derby when that happens, like people plan a year in advance. It's insane, and like, and when that day comes in Churchill, it's like everything like shuts down, and everybody's at. The, I mean, she said literally everything's closed, even the gas stations. <laughs> she's like, it's it's insane. Biggest event, obviously, during the whole year there. It's like their Super Bowl. Yeah, that is amazing. That is amazing. We talked about how it coincides with Cinco de Mayo, a lot of different fights over the years. I think back to, obviously, Pacquiao Mayweather just a couple of years ago. You had Robert Kraft on his jet. Uh, I believe Tom Brady was at the Derby that day. Then he went to the fight in Vegas. It's a celebrity spotting type of event, Wait, as we know. Gronk Gronk year this year? He had a horse. Uh, did he actually it own? Dropped out. The horse dropped out. The horse name was Gronk. Yeah. And I guess he was a part owner of the horse, from what I understand. And uh, it suffered some injury. I'm not sure exactly, but that was the news over the last couple of weeks that, unfortunately, the, the no Gronk. So it'll be interesting to see if the real Gronk is actually Shows there. Up. Yeah. I think he would. He's been there before. He's a partier. He's a partier. Yeah, a it. little bit, right? He loves it. Gronk's going to be there. Maybe not his horse, but he's going to be there. But I'm interested to see who wins. I really am. I'm, a, I'm definitely going to be following this. Oh, yeah, me too. Me, I mean, obviously, everyone's locked into it if you're a sports fan, if you have any kind of sports pulse. And then you tune in for the Preakness as well to see how that horse did the one who won the Derby, if they can do it again. And then, obviously, if, if it's a different horse, then you just you tune out the Belmont for the most part. Yeah. Uh, but uh, everyone gets up for this. First Saturday May, obviously, the 100th. And 44th running, the fastest two minutes in sports. Uh, no lie on that one either. Yes, there's no lie. But, hey, it's it's a – what a rush. To, to be there, Yeah, like, what a rush. Oh, and, no question. Well, I'm going to just say this. I'm going with Fleming Way. I'm going with Fleming Way. That's your pick? Year. I'm going with Fleming Way. Who are you going with? I'm going to go with the favorite. I'm going to take Justify. Because I think Alicia took good magic. She was feeling the, the magic, no pun intended, uh-huh. um, for what she saw from him uh, practicing this week there in Kentucky. I'll go with Justify. I think the from when I last checked earlier this evening, 3-1 to one odds. Yeah, 3-1, to one, but... And I, could, I mean, it's Thursday, obviously. You got 48 hours into post time. It's I'm not going to make it a headache. It's, it's one of those things where you have to just wait till you feel it at the moment and when you get there you're just like... Like okay. when they're actually like filing into their stall. Yeah, like into like, uh, yeah. with them. <laughs> that's, what you, that's how you have to do it. But it's interesting. My my mother was telling me how like her, my, my grandfather, her dad used to go to Kentucky Derby all the time. All the time. How about that? Let's go all the time. And, and he did he... Um, is your mom's side from the East Coast? Originally, no, out no, here, they're, right? They're from out here. Out here, but he just went. He, he, but my 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 grandfather's from Montana, from Bozeman, Montana. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, so they used to go all the time to the Kentucky Derby, and it was like, wow, it was a it's an event to remember. They said, she was like, it has to be on your bucket list, which that's why I'm going to do it. I have to go to Kentucky to go see it. even if it's work, working it, or actually watching it. If it's this type of work. It's not bad. Oh, this is not it's bad. not bad. <laughs> so there you go. A good segment there from Alicia Hughes. Once again, check out her stuff. Blood Horse Magazine, bloodhorse.com. 9593, the Sixers have edged ahead of the Boston Celtics as they come up on just under five minutes to play in Beamtown. So this one, a back and forth affair seesaw battle uh it's what you like to see especially after uh just the the colossal beatdown earlier tonight it's good to see a close game here in uh this nightcap on tnt so we'll keep tabs on that one 96 95 now as boston goes ahead uh we mentioned earlier we do have baseball tonight angels are taking care of business and i believe i'm corrected actually i said that the dodgers had an off day today they didn't they actually played earlier today i believe because they wrapped up that four-game set in Arizona. That's exactly what they did. They actually salvaged the victory. Uh, they won 5-2. to two, All right. And uh, they actually wind up splitting this four-game set. That's so not, not bad. 
Not bad. Not bad. Considering where they were at and what we were talking about on Tuesday, losing Corey Seager for the season, it looked really bleak. So a team you were struggling mightily against, and the Diamondbacks, you come up with a, a split here in the four-game set. That's not bad. That'll get them through as they head into the uh, Padres series this weekend, as we yes. talked a little bit about this week. That they have to win. They have to win. It's going to be in Mexico, by the way, Okay. as part of... They're not really packaging it this way, Major League Baseball, but we're going to package it this way. It's it's their international series, essentially. They played in Japan a couple of years ago, if you remember that, yeah. to open the season. And uh, they played in Puerto Rico earlier this year. So it's Major League Baseball trying to expand the game in itself. We know baseball is already well established in a country like Mexico, yes. Dominican Republic, Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico Venezuela, etc., but again, they're just trying to, I think, maybe push brands, especially with the Dodgers, Padres, and Southern California here going down, playing a series in Mexico. It's going to be fascinating. I'm kind of interested in the, seeing this whole layout down there and, and what the vibe is like on, on TV and how the stands fill up with people. Are people into it? They seem like they were into it in Puerto Rico. Yeah. We talked about that one a, a few weeks ago. 15 innings. Yeah, that was. they got treated that night. It was a good game. Yeah. So we'll, we'll, yeah, we'll we'll see. This it's interesting. It's it got is. it's got my attention. It's got other people's attention yeah, too. Definitely, but on a on a but on a serious note, they they do have to. May is an important month for them, and they gotta. I think they can't split this series. They they have to run. They actually, I think they need to run the table on this series because they're gonna go back and play Arizona right after that. And yeah, that's the thing. They're going like NL West heavy here. Yeah, they've yeah. been that way the first month, and now. Into May here, obviously as well. I agree with you so much, Keith. On that one, obviously, it's just it's vital uh, to continue to stay afloat here and um, to make sure you don't get too far back, as we've talked about in the division. As far as how they did today at the plate, not too bad. They come up with seven hits. Not a bad hitting day. Matt Kemp continues to swing a good bat. A couple of hits today. Scored a run. Also walked. As you go down the lineup, Kyle Farmer he got the start at third base today. He comes up with a hit. Austin Barnes, he spells Yasmani Grandal, so they give Grandal a game off today behind the plate. Barnes comes up with a hit, and as you go down the lineup, it, it, it's a little more consistent. This is what you want to see if you're a Dodgers fan. Yeah, You want to see this type of production. Kiki Hernandez, a good couple of at-bats today. Chris Taylor continues to swing a good bat in the leadoff spot for this team. It's what you want to see. Matt Kemp, we've been har- uh, harping on him all season long. 313 average for him. That's not bad, considering that expectations were next to really nothing when he really came back with this team in the offseason. So he continues to exceed expectations. Cody Bellinger, a good day at the plate today as well. He's a guy that we talked about really needs to step up his game after getting benched, after not hustling hard enough in San Francisco last weekend. You want to see him, one of your young guns, especially with Seager down, continue to step up and could play good baseball. And that's what he did today. Alex Wood, he got the start on the mound today. Not bad, five innings. Not bad. Gives up a run, a couple of hits. The bullpen, I'd like to see, again, you want to see more longer starts, more longevity from your starters. They're dipping in the bullpen still way too much as they have Garcia comes in and he pitches a, a quarter of an inning. Stripling comes in, Kenley Jansen. I mean, you look down here, I mean, after Wood exits the game, they have five different Dodger relievers coming to the game. That's way too much for me. That's way way too, too they, much. they need longevity. True. They need that. And uh, we know, obviously, uh, especially now with Ryu going down last night with a groin strain, we don't really know his timetable, how long he's going to be out. We already know that Rich Hill is down. So it, it's it, you got, at this point, Keith, Kershaw. We have uh, Walker Bueller, the young, the, young, uh, the young gun who's coming yep. in. We hope to maybe see him be a young ace at some point down the line, but he's got a, a lot of uh, innings to pitch here until he gets to that uh, milestone. And uh, you have Alex Wood who pitched today, and uh, Kenta Maeda, in addition to uh, some other guys, Stripling started the other night. So they're mixing and matching some guys here going into the bullpen, coming out of the bullpen starting. Yeah. Kenta Maeda came out of the bullpen last year. He already is one of those guys who kind of moved over into the starting rotation this year. So, again, man, Dave Roberts has his work cut out for him. I, yeah. you, you feel for him at this point because, I mean, he's getting his so money's worth. He's getting his yeah, money's he worth. Is. He's definitely getting his money's worth. But, you know, they, they it's in a way, it's like, you know, this is part of the game. It's a long season. But 
it's also a sense of urgency, like we had said before, because you don't want to get down eight, seven, ten games, you know, and won't be able to crawl out. So they're two games behind San Francisco right now. So hopefully this this can help. They can they can bump up at least by the end of the San Padre series. They can tie. They can be tied with Frisco, and they'll probably be like a game and a half for Colorado, and they're right back in it. So um, this is a sense of urgency time. They're moving pieces around. The Dodgers are to to try to you know sir you know pretty much compete. And um, right now they they got a winning streak going. So hopefully whatever they're doing, they continue to do that until they get their guys back. You know, that's that's the best thing they can do. But, again, yeah, they're going to probably trade up some players, and we it's going to be interesting to see what type of moves they make. But they have to make sure they make the right and correct move because they can also, if they make the wrong one, they can find themselves right back in the situation that they're in right now. Down in Anaheim, meanwhile, we talked about earlier, Angels really taking it to the Orioles, 8 to nothing, kind of reverting back to what they did the first couple weeks of the season, Keith, where you want to see this Angels team go, score a lot of runs, put up a good number, and the uh, the pitching rotation, the bullpen, is holding the opponent down. Berea comes out, he pitches well today, and right now it's just the bottom of the second, and they've already put up eight runs. So uh, off to a hot start tonight. Again, this is what the Dodgers should be doing, and we hope to see them doing coming up against the Padres this weekend, defeating inferior opponents, teams you should be. Again, I, as I said earlier this week, the Angels are not ready for primetime, at least not the primetime yeah. uh, TV show that fe- uh, features the New York Yankees and the Houston Astros. But they are a team that's competent and a quality baseball team because yeah. they're able to beat up on teams they should, and, and that's really what it comes down to. To call in tonight, 213-261-7491, 213-261-7491, Two one three two six one seven four nine one. We're going to step aside for a break. On the other side, we're going to talk about the big news that came down in the NBA today as far as teams who aren't in the playoffs. The New York Knicks, they have a new head coach. His name is David Fisdale. We know what he did with the Memphis Grizzlies, leading them to the playoffs before. Are you excited about that move? We're going to talk to a former New York Knick, that being Chris Childs, and get his thoughts on it coming up after the break. It's behind the mic. We're live here from Kings Cove. Inside the Toyota Sports Center, Brad and Keith coming back for more after this. Every 17 minutes, make a wish makes the impossible possible. They tame dragons. They bring Saturn to Earth. They help superheroes save entire cities. They even make unicorns fly. All to give children the strength they need to fight their critical illnesses. Every wish takes muscle. Help us make sure every wish comes true. Join us at wish.org. Dave, what are you doing? Just sending a gift to Dave2037. Who? Me in the future. I save a little money from every paycheck as a gift to Dave2037, so he can spend it on things like anti-gravity boots or a hologram Doberman. Something cool like that. I think Dave2037 deserves it. He worked hard. What are you getting Steve2037? I guess I was thinking Steve2037 would just fend for himself. Well, all right, but don't expect to be borrowing my anti-gravity boots. You want to have money in your future? You got to start saving now. Putting some money from every paycheck into a savings account or contributing to your 401k can make a big difference later. Put away a few bucks, feel like a million bucks. For free ideas and easy ways to save, go to feedthepig.org. That's feedthepig.org. Hey, Let's just hope Steve2037 doesn't get his hands on a cold time machine because he is going to come back here and knock some sense into you. This message brought to you by the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants and the Ad Council. We all come together and stand together to serve our veterans. We invest in the latest technology. We take the time to train the next generation of doctors and nurses. We work together to make sure we heal their bodies and their minds. This is our mission. More than 300,000 of us working as one, together with families and loved ones. No matter where they live in this country, we'll be there. We stand strong, united. Stand with us in caring for our veterans. Hi, I'm Danica Patrick and proud aunt. Watching my nieces grow, play, and learn is amazing. But not every child gets to be carefree. One in six kids in the U.S. are hungry. One in six. That little girl sitting alone at the playground, she can't play like the other kids. She doesn't have the energy because she's hungry. School lunch will be her only meal today. It breaks my heart that this is the reality in our country. 
but it's something that Feeding America is working to change. Each year, the Feeding America network of food banks rescues billions of pounds of good food that would have gone to waste. This food is then provided to families and children in need. Being a kid should be about using your imagination, learning, and having fun. These children shouldn't have to miss out on simply being a kid because they're hungry. To find out how you can help end childhood hunger in your community, visit feedingamerica.org. Brought to you by Feeding America and the Ad Council. Everybody buckle up. Bum, 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 bum. Buckle up. Let's go. Buckle up. Can we go to the store? Mom, buckle can we up. Get some ice cream? Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Everybody. Everybody, buckle up. A lot goes on in the car, but you're in control. So only move when you hear the click that says they're buckled in. Never give up until they buckle up. Learn more at safercar.gov slash kidsbuckleup. A message from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. This is Behind the Mic with Brad Dalius. Take us with you on the go, wherever you may be. Download that official Behind the Mic app today. Listen online, BehindTheMicShow.com. Check out our podcast on iHeartRadio. Brad and Keith back now behind the mic inside the uh, Toyota Sports Center, Kings Cove, on this Thursday evening. We have NBA playoff action going on. We have, of course, the Stanley Cup Finals that we're keeping an eye on. Dodgers and uh, the Angels actually also in action today as well. Now, though, back to the NBA playoffs and big news today as far as teams who aren't in the playoffs are concerned, Keith. The Knicks, they have their man. They have a new head coach. His name is David Fisdale. And it's an interesting hire, obviously. He did a really good job in Memphis. We know about that. It's a tough situation in New York. Time will tell how he does. But joining us now to talk more about this, former New York Nick played a great NBA career, was actually the assist leader for the New York Knicks during the 1996-1997 season. As we now welcome to the program, Mr. Chris Childs. Chris, how are you doing tonight? Thanks for coming on the show. I'm doing good, guys. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's our pleasure. It's great to chat with you, obviously. What's going on right now across the association, obviously, and the NBA as far as it's concerned? It is the playoffs, but there's a lot of other stuff going on as well. Uh, most notably, like I just said before here, the New York Knicks, your former team, Chris, they have a new head coach. His name is David Fisdale. Your thoughts? Is it a good fit? Uh, yeah, I've, I've known Fizz for a long time with our uh, battles with the uh, Miami Heat back in the day, and uh, I've seen a lot of his success uh, as assistant coach, uh, head coach uh, at Memphis, and uh, he, I think he has a demeanor. And the uh, players respect to uh, get the job done in New York. Hey, Chris, when you look at this New York team and they're coming back uh, this following season, what needs to happen for in order to this team to, to, to make it to the playoffs like they did uh, when you were there? I mean, it, just being back successful like you were when you were with the Knicks, what has to happen with this team? Is Kawhi Litter someone that they, they should really aggressively go after? Well, I don't, I don't know if he's going to be, uh, I don't know if he's a free agent or if he's unrestricted uh-huh. or not, but uh, someone of Kawhi's talent, of course, you would uh, want to add him to your team. Uh, but I think first and foremost, uh, the Knicks have to uh, find a mentality, uh, a way that they're going to play each and every night. Uh, from watching them during the season, I think the way they played the game, their game plan just fluctuated too much. And you didn't know what you were going to get from uh, any given night. And I think the second thing is whoever or whomever is on that team and the direction coming from Fizz, uh, guys just have to know their roles. Uh, I'm pretty sure uh, Hornacek and uh, other coaches before him um, probably told the guys their roles, but a lot of times, players take the button themselves to define their own roles. So um, I think once they once they figure that out, uh, we'll, we'll get back on track. 
Why is it so hard, Chris, to win in New York, and specifically with this franchise, the Knicks? We've seen some great coaches come through, namely Larry Brown, Phil Jackson. He goes into the front office a couple years ago, but it just doesn't work out at the end of the day. Why is it so difficult for this franchise to really uh, get off the ground here and start moving in the direction of a championship type of team? Well, you know, you have to be a, 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 I I don't want to say special type of person, but you have to have uh, strong morals and a strong mindset to survive in New York because the fans expect so much out of the team but the players need to expect more out of themselves first and you can't be afraid to uh, to succeed you have to you know they talk about pressure there's, there's no pressure in playing the game you only put pressure on yourself uh, when you're out there playing but as far as the coaches and uh, the management Everything is timing. You know, I don't, I, the field thing didn't work out. Uh, I don't think there was anything magical that uh, could have been done. They just didn't have the players uh, to put out there on the floor to compete with the likes of, you know, Cleveland, uh, Boston, and all those other teams. So uh, it's just a matter of getting the right core of players, the right mentality, and uh, guys uh, having their roles defined because – Everybody can't score 30. It, it, it'd be nice because then you'll have 200-point games. But somebody got has to play defense, somebody has to rebound, and somebody has to pass the floor. Chris, on, uh, in your opinion, you, you watch the Knicks, of course, and you watched the, you played the game uh, for numerous of years. What, what is one thing that the Knicks have to work on this summer in terms of it, whether it's draft picks getting in there whether it's a veteran guy or like Kristoff Porzingis whether it's, it's it's him getting better what is one key thing that they need to focus on the most well um, I mean you're asking someone that is I'm not the coach I'm not the yeah. GM but I think to make a good competitive team you need draft picks you need guys you know young guys that's that you can teach that's going to be there, but in order to teach them, you have to have quality veterans. Uh-huh. Also, you have to have superstars, but you also have to have veterans that can teach these guys how to play the game, situations in the game. You know, it's, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint, but you have to get off to a good start. Uh, you have to win half of your road games. So just a lot of things that come in, uh, in tune with uh, making a team, and I think quality veterans, one or two veterans on a team goes a long way uh, throughout a season, along with your superstars and your other players uh, that have their roles defined. So uh, hopefully they'll get uh, some draft picks. Um, they might have to make some trades, uh, but you, got, you definitely have to have a mix of uh, veterans and young players, but also superstars. Chris Childs joining us here on Behind the Mic. Chris, your success in the minor leagues back in the 90s really helped to pave your way to the NBA ultimately. What do you think when you see guys like Andre Ingram this year get noticed by the Lakers and all of his hard work in the G League, to see someone like that, to see it all pay off and to see him get promoted to the next level, what does that mean? Obviously, you can kind of relate in a sense. Well, that, that story with uh, him, uh, I, I, uh, kudos to the Lakers. Uh, that, that was very classy. The only thing that I was mad about is they didn't start him. <laughs> <laughs> they should have, right? <laughs> they should have started him. You know, he, all the years he's been down there, they should have started him. But kudos to the Lakers. Uh, that was a very classy move uh, by the people in charge, Magic and Plink or whoever. I think his name Rob Plink or something. I'm not too sure. But uh, being it, coming from the minor league, uh, it prepared me because I was older. Uh, I was in 19, 20 uh, when I, you know, should have been in the league. But the uh, reason uh, that I wasn't was probably the best. I wasn't mature enough. And when you're not mature going into a man's game and a man's world, business world, you tend to get lost. So uh, it, it definitely gave me an opportunity to put some games under my belt against men, bigger men, faster men, and uh, once I got to the NBA, I was 25, and, you know, going out there and playing, 
uh, at that level, I had already seen a lot of it at, at the, the minor league because there's talented players there also. It's just at the NBA, you're getting paid a lot more money. So uh, mentally, I was, I was ready and prepared, and that's what the minor leagues uh, does to young guys. Hey, Chris, you know, everyone's saying, you know, when I grew, I grew up watching you, you know, you had Charles Oakley, you had the Kobe Bryant of the world, you had Isaiah Thomas's, uh, Magic Johnson. I was in that era, the Magic Johnsons. Um, and, you know, and we everybody talks about how the game changes and stuff, and the game has changed now, and, and you don't see that physical play like it was when you were playing. I mean, when you were with the Knicks, it was you – you were a physical guard um, and tough. You weren't the type of guy who gets pushed around. And, you know, refs weren't as involved in the game at that time. And when you look at the game now, does it really irk you as a player, who a former NBA player? Because, I, mean, you know, you hear Charles and Kenny and Shaq and those guys talk about it. Does it irk you as a player when you just see what's going on in the NBA now that it's not, you know, they stop the chippiness and that's it's like taken away from the game in, in, a, in a sense? Well, I mean, the, the game, you know, it it it, it involves it gets it, they change rules every I don't know five years, but uh, it, the rules were changed when I was in the league when you couldn't uh, hand check anymore, and that made it very difficult to guard guys, especially with speed like Allen Iverson or physical and bigger guards that I had to play against, like a. Uh, um, Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant, Mitch Richmond, all those guys who were bigger than me. So it, it made it very difficult. But the game now, they, they had to make the changes because it was it was getting real physical, man. Uh, it's hard for me to watch a lot of the games now because I can pretty much anticipate what the referee is getting ready to call. Um, and, and, you know, with the players, the, the, the amount of, you know, speed that they have now and their athletic ability and uh, guys going to the free throw line 15, 20 times, for, you know, and don't even have to pick up a tooth or, yeah. you know, get to get a bloody lip or whatever. So it's just, you know, that's what's going on in the world today. Same thing with football. So they're trying to change it so their kids uh, be more accessible to, to play the game and not be afraid to play uh, from getting injured. So uh, do I like it? No. Do I do do I uh, watch a whole game these days? No, but it, it's better now for uh, the league and, and the way they're trying to go. So uh, whatever draws the fans in and uh, keep these guys healthy, I'm all for it. What's something we don't know about the Kobe fight? <laughs> What's something that you don't know about the Kobe <laughs> fight? Well, I read an article where he said I snuck him, and he... I looked him in the eye, so I thought when you sneak somebody, you hit them from behind where they don't know it's coming. <laughs> exactly. So right. that, that's one thing. And the other thing, he hit me four times with the elbow. So, and I, I told the referee, I warned him, and uh, he didn't take heed to the warning. So. <laughs> Do you almost embrace that, though, or did you embrace it during your day? Like, sometimes getting into scuffles with players, and, you know, it almost, you, obviously you... You were known for your defense. You played some great defensive basketball during your playing days. And did that almost bring out the best of you sometimes? Almost like a, a friendly type of scuffle. Is there something to that? Well, I don't. I don't think you go into uh, a game looking to get into a scuffle with anybody. But when you're going up against the best player on uh, one of the best teams each and every night as a competitor, you want to compete. As uh, long as it's, it's clean, it's not dirty, I'm all for it. But once it, once it gets dirty, you know, you have to, as a man, you have to, you know, stick up for yourself. But uh, you, don't, you don't go into it looking uh, to get into a scuffle unless there's some previous altercations that's, that happened that maybe the other player did something dirty or got the best of you or whatever. But I never went into a game saying, well, I'm a get into a scuffle with that guy. Yeah. Now, we don't do that. I think they only uh, send out hits uh, in football. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Chris, I just got to ask you this, man. I, I know you I know you following the game, and it's, uh -huh. it's frustrating watching Toronto uh, play. 
you know, they're playing Cleveland. Oh. To me, they got a golden opportunity here. They're ranked number one uh, in the East, and I know this doesn't mean anything, but this is, you know, to me, like, I think this was their golden opportunity right here. The fact that the LeBron James, the Cleveland Cavaliers, don't have the same type of nucleus guys. It's really LeBron, like, kind of carrying the team in a way, in a sense, right now. I mean, he's been doing that the whole year. But let me ask you this. In your opinion, do the Toronto Raptors even have a chance to come back from an 0-2 deficit right now? Do you think there's a chance for that? Or do you think this this series is over? Well, you know, I I have fond uh, feelings for Toronto, the city, the basketball team. Uh, I, have, I can't pinpoint it because it just – seems to get in their head somehow. They, they had game one. Uh, they should have won game one, so game two, you, you would think that they come out with a sense of urgency, which they did, but you can see the self-doubt creeping in, like, oh my God, here it goes again. And you don't want... I, I don't like to say, well, they're down 0-2, they can't come back, because We've done it before when I played on teams, and it was done to us before when I played on teams. So I know it's possible, and I know they have the makeup because I know the coach, and I know uh, how feisty he is and, and what he's preaching. But somehow the guys, the players, have to take it upon themselves and go out there and will a win. Yeah. There's, no, there's no turning back. you got to lay it all out there. And I just don't, I don't see that uh, in their play for 48 minutes. You're going up against a guy that's been in the NBA Finals almost every year he's been in the league. Yeah. So you think it's <laughs> you more know, like so, an in- intimidating factor in a way, like they're just intimidated by it. I'm sorry, say that again? So you, you're in, a, in, a, in a sense, it's like they're intimidated by him, like they just can't get over that hurdle. Well, I don't think that you're intimidated because you, you, there's no way you should be intimidated by another man. Yeah. They might be intimidated by the situation because they've seen this movie before. They, I don't, I, I don't know. I don't know the makeup of uh, another guy's mentality, but their play says says otherwise because they get they'll get to a point in the game to where. They are, they're up 12 or whatever, 8, and then they're down 8, and you don't see that, okay, we're going to get a stop and we're going to score no matter what. You know, I just don't see that in them right now, and I don't know how they climb out of it, but the coaches can only do so much. The players have to be the ones to go out there and make it happen. What's the current state of the NBA for you, Chris? Uh, are you liking the direction the league is going in with so many young players and a lot of different markets where those markets have not necessarily been successful, uh, i.e. New Orleans with the Pelicans, with Anthony Davis. You look in Portland, even though they got swept recently, they still have Damian Lillard. It's a young nucleus there. Obviously, Toronto has been well documented here, as we just talked about, with their struggles. But still, young guys up there north the border. Do you like the current state of the league with a lot of these young guys coming in? Well, I think it's going in the right direction. Um, would you want more teams uh, playing better and the playoffs competing? Of course. But the, somebody else to win, somebody else to lose. Uh, the young players are, are, are awesome. Uh, there's a lot of talent. Uh, you know, I'm watching Ben Simmons, who's 6'10", you know, I'm looking at another, I mean, that's, this is high praise. There will never be another Magic Johnson, but he has a similar uh, type of game. I love I love Westbrook. I love his mentality. I love his, uh, his energy and his uh, determination. Uh, it, uh, Curry, I knew him when he was shooting three-pointers in Toronto, you know, at 11. So... The league is going in the right direction. I just hope that they finally put a team back in Seattle, which is a great market. Uh, and I think they, they, they really got uh, a bad deal when the team uh, left. But uh, they de- definitely deserve a team because that fan base up there is great. Man, that's awesome. Hey, Chris, I got to ask you, man. This is my last question. Now, I can talk to you for hours, man. I just you, – you, you get some great insight. But – in your opinion, 
You is your pick. Who is rookie of the year? Would you go? Is it is it Ben Simmons or is it Donovan Mitchell? If you had a pick and you had to choose, who's your rookie of the year and why? I think they should be co rookies, to be honest. Uh, because you got two players that are rookies. I don't really, well, Ben didn't play, but that's the rule uh, that he's still a rookie. You have one year to mature, to sit on the bench, Thank learn you. the game, Glad practice. That. So that, that rule I'm not in agreement with, but. I think they should be co-rookies. They, they both led their teams to the playoffs, and they both had great numbers. Ben's looked better because of the assists and rebounds, but that's what was called upon him to do for his team. Donovan Mitchell, the, the, the transformation that he went from college to the summer league to playing a whole NBA season is as equally as impressive. So... I know y'all, you know, would rather me pick one, and I never usually straddle the line. But in this case, watching both these young men play, if I had a vote, um, and I know you can't vote co, but um, co-rookies of the year. Wow. I like it. That's a new one. We haven't heard that yet. That's a new one, yes. You separate yourself from the crowd, Chris. Awesome stuff. Great insights. Well, that's what I try to do all my life. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, Chris, man, you got to go and coach, man, in the league, man. Somebody need to call you up, man. You should be coaching in the league. You know what? I've never really wanted to coach. Uh, I like coaching kids. Oh, okay. Uh, I like to catch them when they're young. But uh, in the the NBA, uh, maybe a mentor to these younger guys and, uh, helping them with uh, off the court issues, how to deal with uh, a 24 hour day when they don't have practice or don't have games because with social media, man, you need you need to watch it back all the time because if they had social media back in the day when I played, oh my God, TMZ would be. <laughs> <pew. laughs> Yeah. Chris Childs on behind the mic. Hey, Chris, we really appreciate the time tonight, man, especially at the late hour down on the East Coast in Florida. All the best to you going forward. A lot of great insights tonight here. I think we can see you doing something, uh, if not in the NBA, something uh, very high up there as far as basketball is concerned somewhere down the line. Well, thanks for having me, guys. We should see you down the road. Uh, I enjoy uh, the game of basketball. I enjoy talking to uh, guys like yourself that – Enjoy the game of basketball also. And I just want to say one thing to you guys. You, you have my number. If you need anything, anytime, any information you need to call, uh, don't hesitate. Uh, thanks, Chris, man. We appreciate it's been that. a privilege having you on, man. All right, no problem. Thank you. Take care, Chris. All right. There he goes. Once again, Chris Childs here on Behind the Mic. Getting some awesome insights, obviously, goes without saying. Really, we covered the gamut, uh, Keith, with uh, all kind of different subject areas and getting his thoughts on a lot of different subjects. Uh, what to me, was really interesting, actually, was the uh, Seattle talk yeah. about possibly getting a franchise there. And I know they have problems as far as uh, the city itself getting them to back a new arena and putting certain money into it, and it just hasn't come together yet. Uh, But like him, I I hope it does. It would be good to see a franchise go back there. A lot of, um, you know, a lot of bad blood amongst uh, Super Sonics fans uh, for that franchise leaving, going to OKC, obviously. Everybody thought that, you know, Steve Ballmer was going to be the guy to bring him back, bring the Clippers over to Seattle because that's where he's from, and, you know. Would have been a good fit. It would have been a good fit, but, you know, he has other visions right now. But, yeah, man, I mean, if you think about it, the Sonics were a tough team to beat back in the day. With Sean Kemp, Dale of Shrimp, Gary Payton, those were was, was some tough guys. And then the, the glove. The glove. Oh, man, the glove. Now we have the mitt. Yep, the mitt right now. And then, you, <laughs> and then, you know, you had Kevin Durant and his rookie year come in. and then they Yeah, that's right. The OKC. That, that was his, just one year, right, his rookie year. Yeah, him and Westbrook. Yeah, that's right. And then they end up going to OKC. They've been in the league a long time, if you think about it. If you break yeah. it down, that's a long time. Yeah. It doesn't seem that long. It seems like it's been like a blink of an eye. It does. It does. And, and there definitely needs to be a team in, in Seattle. But I think they have to take a team away. But who would be the team in the West to take away? If there was a team they had to take away, 
who will be the team in order to bring Seattle in. Do they necessarily have to do that? Do they have to take a team away? Well, I think they do. Uh, they, they may not, but I don't know. I think it has to be – I think they play like an even number or an odd number. It, it has to be an even number. But Well, well right now you've got uh, six divisions, right? Yeah. Five teams in each one? So 30 teams. Yes. So, okay, I see what you're saying. I mean, that well, really what they would probably look to do would be add two. Yeah, add two. That, well, that, what would you, where were you at? I know, I tell you who to take away. Atlanta Falcons. The Hawks. <laughs> I mean, the Hawks. The Hawks, yeah. The Atlanta Hawks. I said the <laughs> well, Falcons. I think Falcons fans might have maybe wanted their team to go away after yeah. losing the Super Bowl. The Atlanta ago. Hawks. You take away but, the Atlanta Hawks. You have to take away the Atlanta Hawks know. or move one to the – if you go, you move Atlanta Hawks to the – you can move them – and then maybe move a team from the west over to the east and take the Atlanta Hawks out the picture. What are the reasons though for taking away the Hawks? Besides, they got the stink. fan base is horrible. They, I mean, they don't show up. Well, they don't show. Wait, 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 wait. You know what? They do show up. They, it's like a club going. But no, they don't. Their team is just their franchise is all bad right now in Atlanta. Well, they stink. Obviously, yeah, that goes without saying. But I, I don't know if you're really realistically going to get a team to be taken away. I'd be really surprised if that happened. Yeah, I think you add two. Like I said, and where do you go? Put a team in Seattle, and let's see. I think the West is mostly stacked, unless you wanted to go down. I don't know if there would be a market for it, but how about San Diego? They've only got one professional sports team there now with the Padres. It's a laid-back city. It's a little different. It works for baseball. Obviously, the Chargers are gone. They're up here in L.A. now. That would be interesting. Again, I don't know if there would be a market for it, but that would be intriguing. As far as the East Coast is concerned... Maybe I mean you got a team already in Boston. How about if you go down towards the south? I don't know. Maybe you go. Um, maybe you put another team in North Carolina somewhere. Maybe you have two teams there because that obviously you have uh, that kind of covers the whole market of North and South Carolina. You can maybe mix in something in that area. I don't know. I think it's more likely that you see it on the West Coast, maybe in like a San Diego, or I think maybe Baltimore. I'm, Baltimore? Ooh, that's not bad. That's not bad. Baltimore. You could also do Canada. The Grizzlies used to be in Vancouver. Vancouver's a great city. That is a great city. Uh, a big sports city, from what I understand. Haven't yeah. been there personally, but they've got the Canucks, obviously. I can see them adding a basketball team. They used to have one, like I said. Why not another? Yeah. I, I, why not? I mean, Vancouver has been a. Uh, they had a great little. They had a great run at their time. You know, Toronto stayed. Vancouver went, but uh, why not bring it back? Seattle and Vancouver. There you go. Yeah, close by, close proximity. Essentially, yep. up there in the Pacific Northwest, that would work. Honestly, that would, that would actually probably work better than San Diego. I, I'd like to see San Diego just get another professional sports team, uh, but uh, I, I don't. Again, I don't know if there's a market for it nah, at this point. Not right now. Maybe a hockey team. Hockey in San Diego? Yeah, the San Diego, I don't know. <laughs> Dolphins, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Dolphin skate? That, that, Dolphin that'd skate, be funny. Yeah, right? That'd be funny. So I thought that was interesting how uh, Chris brought that up there, talking about obviously the Supersonics maybe getting a new franchise uh, based in Seattle. But outside of that, he seems to be a fan, Keith, of the hire of Fisdale. Yeah. That was interesting to see to him to say that because – he had sent a tweet out a long time ago, and he had said, I was interested to hear what he was going to say, and he said, they don't hire his guy. I don't know if it was Fizz or who was that, or Mark Jackson and somebody else, and they don't really want to win. So I think Fizz is, maybe it was Fizz that he was talking about as well. But great hire. I thought it's got to either be Mark Jackson or Fizz. Everybody wanted Fizz. We talked about this last night. Yeah. And I think Mark Jackson is the next one up. Honestly, I think it worked out good that Mark Jackson is still in the broadcast booth for ABC. I think it also worked out good that Kenny the Jet Smith yes. is with TNT. Yeah. This is a tough job. This is a t- honestly, it's the toughest job right now in the NBA, the head coach of the New York Knicks. Like I said oh, before yeah. when we were talking with Chris, some of the biggest names in the history of sport of the NBA have tried – to be successful there, have gone to the Big Apple. Larry Brown, we know they paid him a king's ransom to be that head coach. Didn't work out. Phil Jackson tried the front office route. 
to not work out. They've had talent there. That's the thing. They've had talent. Carmelo Anthony was there. Couldn't get it done. So they've had pe- the talent's been there. Yeah. They just have not been able, for whatever reason, to get these guys to play together and to put winning basketball on the floor. We talked about it last night. They got the superstar in Christoph Porzingis. He's there. You've got him to work with. You can you can build around them and uh, build around him specifically. The question is, do they attract talent? This has been a big problem, especially even going back to the decision in 2000 with LeBron the first time around. He was contemplating the Knicks, but he didn't go there. Yeah. And one of the reasons is, is just because this team has failed to win basketball games. They yeah. can you can offer they can offer so much in New York as we all know, biggest city in the world, in the country. But they can't they can't guarantee winning basketball, which is what the big free agents want. They yeah. want to go to places where they know that they're going to put themselves in a good chance to, to chase a championship. But you know what? He he Chris said something that really stuck with me. He said it doesn't. It's not just about the coaching. The players got to know their roles. Everybody can't go for thirty a night, and I think that's what it is. That's the first thing you got to do. Is Fizz when he gets in, is sit the players, each the players down, and tell them what their role is on this team, and then really sticking to it to the end. And you know, uh, no one's bigger than the team. But I think that I think he hit it right on the nail right there, and I think that's the why the reason why. When he played on the Knicks, they were so successful because everybody kind of knew their roles on the team. They knew exactly what they were, what they were supposed to do, who, where the ball should go, whose hands it should be in down the stretch, you know, and just everybody play their 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 role on the team. And so I think that's really what it comes down to is that he would be a great coach if I at least assisted, but mentoring for sure. You can tell just. Off the conversation in the interview, he'll be a great mentor for a lot of these players. I can see it. Uh, first time talking with him tonight for me personally, I could absolutely see it. The more you talk to him, too, the better the stuff. Yeah, yeah, you get more comfortable. You get great stuff out of him, as was evident right here just a couple minutes ago on Behind the Mic. It's a four-year deal for Fizdale, by the way. Four years to be the head coach of the New York Knicks. How many years does he realistically have? Do you think he will have, Keith? To really get this team going here, I think he, I think I think they'll give it the four. Yeah, I think the four, maybe three. It's New York, though. It's New York, but they know they got a new coach in there, a new time. Fizz is going to drop there. He's going to. Fizz just wants to improve all the way until like that third. I say that third year. They got to be in that playoffs compete in that third year. Got to make the playoffs in the third yeah. year. Now you could almost make the case that there may be be some pressure to make the playoffs in year two yeah so uh, we'll see I, again i go back to it it's new york and uh it's you know one of the toughest media markets in the country a lot a lot of pressure for so many of the sports teams there to really start putting competitive teams consistent competitive teams on the field whether it be on the field with the new york jets on the court with the new york knicks the rangers are another team who stu uh i uh, can't seem to get on the right yeah. track as well so a lot of different teams right now in new york are trying to get it going but david fisdale officially headed to new york he's actually he's been living out here in los angeles i guess he lives here he has lived here full time manhattan beach really i didn't know that yeah, so local yeah. right here in the south bay yeah manhattan beach a lot of them live out here though manhattan beach as i've started to my learn. dad tony lived in manhattan beach okay you know a lot of them live out here in Manhattan Beach. So I saw Steve Nash today, actually walking around. Oh yeah, Steve. Steve lives around here. He's bigger than what you thought, huh? He a little is. bit, a little tall. bit. Yeah, he is. And you stand up to him, you're like, oh shit, Steve. Steve is tall. <laughs> I wasn't in the, a close proximity, oh, okay. but I, yeah. I, I was. I could. I could at least tell. I have. That, yeah, there, yeah I could at least a, tell. He's a cool guy. I've actually sat in the bar before and had some you know had a drink and actually sat right next to him and we were watching games and talking. How about that? So he was a good guy. So that's great. You know what else is interesting? His pick, I thought he was gonna make a pick, man. Cole, rookie. Okay. Go on the fence. But I, but I have to agree with split it right down to, the middle. I have to agree with him. I don't agree with the rule. I don't agree with the rule of Ben Simmons having a year and then still, you know, because he yeah, still sat the team, he still I, got I a agree. paycheck. He didn't play. I don't no, I don't agree with that. And he doesn't either. So you can tell, like, uh, that's that's 
You got. I think. I think he's going to go to Donovan Mitchell at the end of the day. Oh, he's been phenomenal, especially if Utah is able to maybe, dare I say, defeat the Houston Rockets and go on to the Western Conference Finals. And if Philly loses ultimately to the Celtics in this series, it's even more of a case too. Because when did they announce that? It was when they announced kind of the league MVP, right? Yeah. Right before the finals are about gonna, to start. I bet you they'll announce it before the end of this here this series. At the end of this series, for sure. It's got to be Mitchell. We're watching a superstar in the making. I don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves. He's only a rookie, but I really think he, he is a special, special player. Ben Simmons is a very good player. I think he's got potential to be a very, very great player in this league, but Donovan Mitchell, we even talked about it last night with his attention to detail, the way he studies the game, the talk of uh, you know him taking Kobe Bryant's advice to heart and his pointers to heart. There is a superstar in the making there in Donovan Mitchell. At least he is starting to go on that path. So it's fun to watch. I agree. He should be Rookie of the Year. By the way, speaking of Ben Simmons, his Sixers fall tonight to the Boston Celtics, 108-103. Five-point win for Boston, up two games to none now as this series heads to Philly. But you're not concerned, are you, Keith Jackson? Nope. I um, I think Philly's going to they're going to get two games up there. I think they'll get they'll get one or two. They'll they'll take care of business out in Philly. So why, why the why? confidence in them that they're able to do? They'll seemingly be able to do that with ease because they seem to play better at home. They play a lot better at home, and they barely lost tonight. They try to pull off the barely enough tonight. But really, remember what I told you a couple of weeks ago? I said that. This is now the, this is I wanted to see Philly in this position because I want to see how can they overcome adversity. They're you did. A team now they're in that position. Now you're going to see what Philly is really about. Can they dig themselves out this hole and go back to uh, Boston two uh, two, or is it a, is it a wrap for Philly? Are they going to self destruct? And I don't think they're going to self-destruct. But this is is really going to be interesting to see what they do. Game three, they got to win. Would they benefit at all, especially going back home now, to Markel Fultz getting some action? Didn't play tonight. Would they benefit at all from him, or would that just be doing more harm than good? I think you got to, man. I don't know what's the reason. I don't know the, the reason for sitting him. I don't get it. So... I th- to me, I think it's it's a confidence thing. You, in order to build someone's confidence, sitting them on the bench is not going to help their confidence. I, I think it's more so of playing in that atmosphere in Boston and how that team can come at you. I think it's a little bit of that. Brett Brown you gotta, you gotta, doesn't want to. He's only. I mean, he's only a rookie. He hasn't played for the majority of the season with all the crazy injury uh, yeah. stuff that surrounded him and the team. It might be almost ba- I, This is just what I think Brett Brown is thinking. It might almost be better to just not play him in some of these road games. But if he doesn't play him at home in Philly, I, I, that's puzzling. Yeah. But you can't do – I think it's more of – it's not a smart move because he's an NBA. He's a professional athlete. He's accustomed to playing on the road, and he's played on the road before, and he's done He's done fairly well. Um you gotta play. You can't. You can't. You can't shell him or hold him back. You gotta let him go. You know, and and see what they do. But right now, it's it's about it's it's really about. Uh, they gotta take care of the night. I mean, they gotta take care of the next game. Because let's say they they win the next they if they lose the next game but win the five, the ne- the game after that, it's still over. It's a wrap. They gotta win two games in Philly. But we've got more confidence in them. But I got more confidence in them. Oh, absolutely. Than Toronto, Toronto going on the road. Toronto lost at home, too. Oh, they are not going. Toronto. It's a joke. It's a complete joke, they honestly. They shouldn't even been there. It, it's, they are. Shouldn't even been there. I mean, to me. You blow two double-digit leads in both games? Doesn't make any sense. They shouldn't even been there. So, And uh, um, going back to uh, one of your questions from earlier, in regards to uh, Chris, when we were chatting with him about uh-huh. Toronto being maybe intimidated yeah. by LeBron James. They're not intimidated by LeBron James. They're intimidated by LeBron James' production. 
Yeah. I think that's that's how I would view this. Yeah. They're intimidated by his production and what he's been able to do because now, like we said, this is a complete psychological aspect of this uh, uh-huh. for the Raptors, why they're struggling in this series. I yeah. think so, at least. And a lot of it leads back to what he's been able to do. It's the sample size yeah. of LeBron's production. That's what it is. I, I don't know if there's anybody who really fears LeBron as just as he is per se but again it's just it's the production and it's to me it's just it's coupled with uh how he's just been able to and the Cavs as a whole just own this team last couple of years that's been the biggest thing yeah well I can tell you this LeBron right now is is playing out of his mind uh he's unstoppable and it takes a collaborative effort in order to beat the Cleveland Cavaliers. And it's interesting. It goes back to the whole thing is, are they better than they, what they were when they made the trade? I mean, proof's in the pudding. And right now it shows that they are. You know, but It seems that way. Yeah, it definitely seems that way. Now, they, they turn it into an extra gear when the playoffs come around. Because Cavs fans are like, where was this all year? So I, I don't know if we'll ever know exactly because it was the first half of the season. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, And then the second half rolls around. They happen to make the trades at the deadline. And then now they turn it on. I think you can make the case they might have been able to do this with the other cast of characters as well. Because, uh-huh. again, it comes back to just one guy who is really the leading the charge here. He can do – I mean, let's put it this way. If – you, it's it's comparable to Tom Brady with the Patriots. If you can catch a football as a receiver and you can run, you're mobile, physical, you're going to be able to, to play for the Patriots and catch balls from Tom Brady. If you're able to dribble the basketball, know your role in the team, as we talked about earlier, you're going to be able to play with LeBron James. Yeah, that's true. Hey, but he's it's, – it's, when you watch him play – I mean, 42 minutes. He's playing 40, 41 minutes. 40, getting their minutes right. Re- that's just impressive to see from him. But it's going gonna, gonna to take a toll. It's going to take a toll and that when they play against it. Look, if they play if they play Boston, let's say they play Boston in a, in a semifinal, that's going to be a dragged out semifinal. I mean, I mean, a dragged out Eastern Conference final. I agree. Because now you've got team. a great genius coach who's coaching. Out there. It's going to be scrappy. It's going to take a while. LeBron. I think LeBron's going to eventually come out top. But, but you know what this, the great thing about this team, the position they're in? They played more road games than they did home games. And they had to start off on the road, LeBron and the Cavs. So if they make it to the championship, we're assuming they'll probably play Golden State. No. At least they'll be prepared. Really? At least they'll be prepared. <laughs> you know, at least they'll be prepared because they're used to playing on the road. That's a good point. See, this is why a lot of fans are, are getting annoyed at the NBA because it's shaping up to be Golden State Cleveland Part 4. Jeez. Indiana was this close. The Pacers, Keith, that yeah, close. The, I'm going to blame it on the NBA. I'm blaming it on the NBA. Oh, they totally blew the goal. They did yeah, that. of course they did. We they know did that. that. They, wanted, they want LeBron James to get back in there. But it's amazing how the Pacers, with Victor Oladipo, are actually a better team than the Toronto Raptors. Yeah. That's amazing. Toronto's are is a joke. Let's just call it what it is. All you Toronto fans out there, you should be ashamed of your team right now. I wouldn't tell them. I'm like, yo, y'all keep yourself in the gym tonight. You know, just do, or go home and do some soul searching. Do we need to go to Cleveland, Ohio? Do we got to go to Cleveland? I mean, do you guys want to go to Cleveland? Or you want to hang it up? Because this is... I, well, that's what sad. Dwayne Casey right now is preaching to him. You figure in the post game in the locker room is I mean, you can't say how are we no, going to go? How are dude, we going to move we forward? Can't, here? We can't say no more, man. I, I, it's, it's t- it comes to a time where it's like, okay, the chips didn't fall where they fall. No, it comes to a time where you just got to go off on these fools now and be like, you know what? I'm tired of this. The problem is they can't do it for 48 minutes. They can't. They can do it for a half. We've seen that. They can do that. But 48 minutes against the best player in the world at this point in time, n- during a course of a best of seven, nonetheless, no chance. no chance. No chance at all. Like you said the other night, Keith, it is definitely the will to win. And it's also just a team on the flip side who just has no conceptual idea of how to beat a team of this magnitude. You look back during the, the course of NBA history with some of the great dynasties, some of the great duels, some of the great individual stars, Kobe and Shaq, 
You couldn't beat him. Nope. You couldn't beat him. Uh, not not when the money was on the table for all the marbles. You couldn't knock him off their spot. Uh, Isaiah Thomas, the original Isaiah Thomas with the bad boy Detroit Pistons and, and that crew back in the 90s, you couldn't beat him in a spot. We all know about Michael Jordan and how they were dominant with the Bulls and their six championships. You go back to, I mean, way back in the 50s and 60s with Bill Russell and yep. the Boston Celtics. I mean, uh, obviously it was different times, and uh, Boston was way ahead of the curve with Red Arbach and the guys they were picking. And uh, But, again, it's just – it's it's having the the best players on your team, and it's just their drive to be the best that they're going to be. And sometimes you have to tip your cap to that. Yeah. And although this is a meltdown from Toronto, at the end of the day, when they lose the series, which they will lose, as yeah. we all know at this point, it's because they lost to one of the greatest players of all time. And I, there is this, and even though that. Dwayne Casey may get fired and they may somewhat shake up the roster. There's really nothing that they, they could have done unless they were to have uh, a LeBron James of their own on their team. You know what doesn't make sense to me? Is they got depth. They got They do. They have depth. But it's not much inside. better though. Honestly though, Keith, it's not much better than what Cleveland is putting out there. The problem is is, I mean, think about it. You got Serge Ibaka or Tristan Thompson. Who are you picking? Serge Ibaka. Right. You know, you have a you have a team. The problem is when you watch this team play, it's Kyle Lowry and DeMar DeRozan going to the basket, doing it themselves. And you can't have that. You have to work inside in. You got to find the mismatch in that. And to me, the mismatch is down low. Serge has to be more of a present on the, on the in the game. You know. Uh, what about Valanciunas? Valanciunas is great. But he, they have to. He has to be more of a presence in the game as well. You got to go down to the bigs and then work it out to them, because then that's going to free up. You got Demar Derozan and Kyle Lowry shooting fadeaway threes in the corner with two guys on them. Like that's not going to get you guys over the hump. That's what you've been doing for the last four years. You played them. Like that's not going to work. Definition of insanity is doing the exact same thing time and time again, expecting the same results. Toronto Raptors have fallen into that definition at this point in time. Yeah. Let's switch gears here as we come up on our final segment of the show and the final segment of the week here on Behind the Mic. Matt Ryan, he was already a very wealthy NFL quarterback, but he's going to get a whole lot wealthier, Keith. Signs a big extension today with the Atlanta Falcons. It's a five-year deal, $30 million per year, $100 million guaranteed. He's the first player in NFL history to get that type of contract, $30 million per year, it's a lot of change yeah. for a quarterback who's been good. He's been a very, very solid, good NFL quarterback, franchise quarterback for this team for a decade now out of Boston College. Took him to a Super Bowl. They've won a bunch of divisional titles. They've won some big games. But they haven't won the Super Bowl, and I, I just I don't know. I, I, I think back to when I think of Matt Ryan right now in recent history, I think of him – Wiltering in the Super Bowl against the Patriots, and I think of him being stopped short of the end zone in Philly last year in the divisional round when they had a chance. Atlanta had a chance actually to defeat the Eagles at that point in time. So they've come up small in some of the biggest moments, and that's not always fair, but that's reality in sports sometimes. Mm -hmm. So again, it's a lot, a lot of money to throw at a guy who has been good, but again, I don't know if I pay him that much money. I don't. I don't. I don't pay Matt Ryan thirty million a year. Look, you're to me. I mean, okay, he made the he made you saw he made the Super Bowl two years ago. Where we know what happened there, and then he didn't make it this year. And I mean, honestly, I think he in a way because his contract since it was up. There's not too many great. What other quarterback at his in the, at his stature at his level is there out there for the Atlanta Falcons to go get? It ain't too many, you know. They don't so, grow in trees. Yeah, so I think it's kind of like they had a force of hand to, to give up the money to give to them. But you know what sucks about this, what it does? The receivers, the wide receivers. If you, as you know, Odell Beckham has come out and said, I want to get paid. Or not Odell, but also Le'Veon Bell as well, as they both came out and said, I want to get paid like the quarterbacks. You know, I want to get paid more money like the quarterbacks. And – and in honestly, way, like, you gotta. It's in a way, it's like they got a point, man. 
They don't want putting up the numbers. They don't want taking the most hits. But they don't want putting up the numbers. But we all know it's not the age of the running back anymore. It's not. It's and these not. guys are a dime a dozen. Although Bell is a superior talent, and maybe we actually see Saquon Barkley eventually morph into that yeah. type of player, but still, you're going to have a hard time convincing any general manager in the NFL to pay top dollar to any running back at this point in time because we know they're so expendable. That's going to be very interesting, obviously, to, to follow that situation into this summer, into the OTAs, mini camp, yeah. training camp, to see what they eventually do with Bell and if they pay him the money or not. But uh, you, you can't convince me to pay anybody, I don't care who you are, yeah. uh, running back at this uh, day and age, that uh, top dollar of money. But with Atlanta, they have it's been interesting because they have been one of those franchises who has thrown a lot of money towards their skill position players. Yeah, You, you look... A few years ago when they drafted Julio Jones, they traded away. They moved up in the draft to take him. They paid him a lot of money. They've had other guys, obviously, as well, uh, Freeman. And just across the board, they have really dished out the cash. You don't see that too much. It's interesting, and that obviously hasn't resulted in a championship yet for them. But they're a team who it seems like in the last four or five years has been in a win-now type of mode, and they'll do that again here in 2018 but this is somewhat of a, a pressure year for them because yeah. of all the money they spent and how much they have invested keith for dan quinn and company they're gonna have to make it to the super bowl and, and that's a tall order in an nfc that's been obviously improving so much this offseason uh, so a lot of pressure to win now in 2018 or 2019 uh even though quinn uh has only been there for a couple of years and has been to the super bowl but we know it's more pressure now than ever to win a championship in this league. Yeah, you're absolutely right. You're you're absolutely right. Um, it's going to be a tough a tough situation to do, but you know, as you look at it and you look at the team and and what they're able to accomplish, they've accomplished a lot. You know, so I'm looking towards seeing them do uh, do big things. Uh, next year, I mean, if Matt Ryan is signed uh, thirty million, he's getting thirty million this year. It's, that's just that's an insane and a large amount of money um, to be given someone. But I mean, it's a, it would be a lot of pressure uh, to me. It's a lot of pressure for for Matt Ryan. You know, Matt Ryan's dad's got some definitely got some pressure on him this year. Uh, that you know, you got to show your worth, and if they're going to give you that type of money. I mean, you better be winning ball games with that type of money. If you're getting thirty million, I mean, you better be taking your team to the AFC, the AF, I mean, the NFC Finals. <laughs> you know, con- oh, the you finals better. every year. Because if you're not, they, if you're not, man, that's a that's a quick trader. That's going to be a very disappointing franchise. Oh no, I, I completely agree. I mean, there, there's just so much pressure on Atlanta. Talking about the Atlanta market, obviously, yeah. and some of the sports teams there. The Braves actually have a, they obviously won big tonight over the Mets, like you talked about earlier, Keith. And they're a younger team, but the Hawks aren't going anywhere. The Thrashers aren't going anywhere. No. And uh, we know about the recent struggles on the big stage as of late with the Atlanta Falcons. Other NFL news today. We talked about earlier this week Jason Witten. It looks like he was going to retire. He officially made that announcement today. He's done. He's hanging him up. It is official now, all signed, sealed, and delivered. And I thought actually originally he was going to be an analyst or or like a you know um, a part of the um, the stage and um, on the set for Monday Night Football. He's going to do color. He's going to be number two. Oh. They're actually like so we know Gruden's obviously gone. Yeah. So he he replaces John Gruden. Sean McDonough, who called play by play last year, is going back to college football, and they're going to insert Joe Tessitore to do play by play on ESPN. So you got. The grouping of Joe Tessitore, play-by-play, yeah. and Jason Witten doing color for Monday Night Football. That's awesome. You like it? I like it. He, he can learn from his buddy, Tony Romo. He can give him some pointers. He can. I still go back to say, there's something about the Dallas Cowboys organization. They got to end with, uh, they definitely got an end. Yeah, they definitely do. You know, they're getting broadcasting over some of these guys that be going to broadcasting camp and can't get a, can't get a job. That's I'm like, you got to play for the Dallas Cowboys. You got to play for the Dallas Cowboys if you want to get a job after 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 uh, after the season. I mean, or after you retire, there's a great position for you. So you, Dallas Cowboys, 
You know, that's the organization to go to. That's what I would go to if I was playing there. I'm, I'm going to Dallas. Why not, right? Yep. Ezekiel Elliott, Dak Prescott. Man, brave future ahead of him, even if it doesn't work out. Exactly. Even if it doesn't work out on the field with the Cowboys. Final thoughts as we wrap up behind the mic. No, I was sitting here thinking about it. And my final thoughts is going to go to Ryan Shazier as the Pittsburgh the Pittsburgh Steelers organization converted his signings to a signing bonus and they're going to while he's, while he's while he's rehabbing you know they're going to give him basically 8.26 million dollars uh what he's on there over his base salary they're going to give that to him so i think that's very classy of the pittsburgh steelers and that's a bright you know and i think he's well deserving of it you know he was one of their leading uh tackles this this past season until he got injured and what a motive uh, and what a way for him to, you know, bounce back. And he's actually walking again, re- rehabbing, trying to get back on the field. It's probably going to take him, I guess, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing maybe two more years to get back on the field. The way it looked, the way he was walking gingerly, and so I was like, uh, he's not definitely not ready for contact for this year. And they officially announced that he will not play in 2018. Yeah. That was officially announced now. And yeah. uh, like you, we were talking about this last week during the draft, obviously. And When he came up, it was just I, like I, too, I, that, too gingerly. That was, was that the first time he made a public appearance, like actually walking since the injury? I think. I Probably so. I must mean, have been. Yeah. That he was he was there when the Pittsburgh Steelers played uh, right New England New the regular England. season. I, he then, was waving the towel, yeah. sitting down. But as far as like walking in public, I I think that was yeah. the first time. Yeah, I, I did honestly. I did not know where he was at. Yeah, and, and I I didn't expect that. I didn't expect him to, to be uh, obviously. I thought he was a little more progressed. I hadn't followed the situation too close, but uh, yeah, it's evident that, that yeah. he will not play this season and yeah. uh, but think, hopefully he just can you know continues to get better and better that's the thing i mean just being able to walk again is yeah. a blessing within itself and, and it's very classy of the pittsburgh steelers to give him basically his money that is well deserving for him so you know kudos to the to the pittsburgh steelers and prayers and thoughts go out to the shazir ryan shazir family and ryan himself and hopefully we can see him back on the field one day so Ichiro, it looks like his career is over, Keith. Uh, he actually, tonight, he was going to play for the Seattle Mariners. He's back with them this year, obviously. He's bounced around the last couple of seasons. Uh, obviously, originally came into Major League Baseball with Seattle. But tonight, he jogs out onto the field and basically kind of uh, during the warm-ups uh, pregame and, and says that uh, this is going to be it. I'm, g- I'm, I'm not going to play anymore, or at least I'm going to put the career on hold. I'm going to go, and he gets a gig with the front office, with the Seattle Mariners, and that's what he's going to do for the rest of the 2018 season. That's unbelievable. Ichiro, a front office gig for Seattle. And uh, this, it, it, to me, it still kills me to this day that he, I wish he would have came over a lot sooner yeah. because uh, he would have really been threatening Pete Rose's hit record at this point in time. It would have been super close. Uh, but... Uh, each year, I mean, one of my favorites, actually, one of my favorite baseball players of all time. It's always been fun to kind of follow his career and watch him. And if he never, if this is it, if he never plays again, obviously a first ballot Hall of Famer. That goes without saying. Uh, all those years consecutively of a 300 batting average or higher, all those hits. If you look at career hits, like I said, not exactly. only in the Major League Baseball, but when he played in Japan, you got like 4,000 hits plus. So. Uh, really an unbelievable career and uh, interesting turn of events here if this ultimately goes down this way that he never plays again and just uh, goes into a front office role with Seattle. Who knows? Maybe maybe that is his future. Yeah, Looks maybe. like he, he wants to stay around the game for a long time, and uh, that would be one way of doing it, obviously. So we'll see. A lot of former players trying uh, to go into the front office or in ownership roles with Derek Jeter and others here of late. Uh, trying to make their mark in a different way, not on the field, uh, but uh, trying to make their mark, obviously, some way to be successful uh, with a Major League Baseball organization. Great show tonight. Oh, yeah. I mean, a great show here from Kings Cove. Uh, Really got to thank Chris Childs for calling in, especially down in Florida late night. Yeah. (laughs) He stayed up late for us. It was great. It was great. It was great. So big thanks to him. Also want to thank tonight Alicia Hughes. From Blood Horse Magazine, bloodhorse.com, Kentucky Derby coming up this weekend. Definitely check it out. Again, I'm going with Justify, and you've got Fleming Way. We'll see who wins. Fastest two minutes in sports. 
Thanks for tuning in tonight. We'll talk to you next week. Keep living the dream.